Well, if you've not been with us, we are on the third week of a four-week series on vision. Uh, we've been looking at how we find God's vision for our lives as individuals and as a church. How do we uh, confirm that vision? How do we live by that vision so that we have a life of passion and purpose and ministry instead of just kind of getting through the status quo? And since we've got um, a few folks with us that haven't been part of the, the last two um, talks, I want to make sure we do a little bit of recap to get us in the right place. See, what we've been going through to kind of have this conversation and find this together is a model that oftentimes you find it within the business world. Uh, you know, if you've been in like a professional environment at all, you might have heard of a mission statement or a vision statement or code values, those type of things. But instead of borrowing it from the business world and talking about from a ministry perspective, we're just kind of recognizing this is God's way in the business world because we're made in His image, just kind of borrowed it from Him. So we're using that as a model to be able to dig into things. Now, if you've not been in one of those type of environments, this is basically how mission statement, vision statement, and core values work together. Mission statement is always the big dream. It's the big goal. It's the thing that makes everybody passionate. And the example I used before and I'll use again is if I wanted to start an organization and our dream, the thing we're passionate about is that no one ever goes hungry again. Like that, that, that's the big dream. That's what we're excited about. We, we just, we want to see that come, that, that promise come someday. So we might have a mission statement somewhere along the lines that uh, our mission is to make sure that no one goes hungry ever again, no matter where they're at, no matter what the circumstances, period. Now, a mission statement usually is bigger than one organization or one person can do by themselves. You usually are counting on others who have the same mission to do their part. So the vision statement gives you your, your scope or your focus. This is all part of that big dream. So maybe for our case, we, we decide that um, we're going to work with four or five other partnerships and we're going to focus that there's never hunger again in Haiti. So while these other organizations focus on the United States and over Russia and over Africa and all the different areas, as we all do our part, someday we'll realize the big dream. But our part is from a Haiti perspective. And then there's usually co-values. Co-values are usually four or five statements that take and direct you in that mission, that make sure that you stay on that vision when it comes to your finances and your times and your efforts and those type of things. Uh, but if you don't have one of those, everything else kind of falls apart. Because if you have like core values without a mission, then there's no passion. It's just getting through the daily grind again. So these three things work together. So we've been looking at those things, again, from a personal standpoint and, and as a church standpoint. If you've missed the last two, again, there's podcasts, both video and audio, all available in multiple places, including the church website. Um, but as we go into core values, we're kind of starting to talk more about the church aspect of things. And what is our part as individuals, as those who call ourselves fellowshippers within this particular mission of wherever God has you plugged in? So let's talk about the mission and the vision statement, because if we don't have that back into the conversation, we'll miss things. So Chris, if you would, let's go ahead and put up the mission statement. Uh, and it's just kind of the reference of the mission statement, because as I've shared with you last week, when it comes to the mission statement of the church, it's not something we have to create. It's not something we have to hire consultants to do. We don't have to go on some kind of wilderness leadership retreat to figure out what our mission is. Jesus Christ gave us our mission. It is from Matthew 28, and also I bring in a little bit of Acts 1, that we are to go and lead people to Jesus. We're to lead the world to Jesus, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and disciple one another, or teach each other how to grow, to be more like Jesus, to follow all of his commandments. And we're to do that in our hometowns, we're to do that in our country, with people that are different than us, and then the, the entire world. That's our mission. So in other words, our mission statement is, we don't want anyone to go spiritually hungry, hungry in any way, shape, or form in this world. That's the big dream. That, that, that's what should make us passionate. And if we look at the Great Commission and go, oh yeah, you've lost it. If we're owning the vision, you've got to own the mission. We've got to be excited about no one ever going spiritually hungry again. And we as the church working together will see that day of reconciliation. And we get to be a part of that. Now, the vision becomes for the Shepherd's Fellowship part of it. And again, we talked about how you find your vision statement as an individual in a previous talk as well. But for us, our, our vision of that, our scope of that, is that we will, and we'll put that up too, but we'll be an authentic community. We're going to be a real community. We're, we don't have to be like looking perfect all the time. We don't have to just go through the motions. We're going to be a community. 
We're not going to be a cluster of cliques. We're going to be a community. We're going to be an authentic community. We're going to be an opening com- uh, community that fulfills that big dream of no one being hungry, spiritually hungry again, by being people of faith who act by God's promises instead of what we see, displaying hope, which is the natural, natural response of trusting God, and being people of love. And if each of us are doing that as individuals and collectively, anywhere that we find ourselves to be, whatever mission field you have, we're doing our part for the big dream of leading people to Jesus Christ. Still with me? Sweet. Okay, well, what we haven't talked about is our core values. These are the type of things that we don't necessarily talk about. You usually find on a brochure or website, but it's good for us to dive into because, again, these are the things that give us our direction on the decisions that we make. These are the core values of our church. We will love God by obeying and following Him. We won't just say we love God. We love God by obeying and following Him. We will love each other within the church or within the body of Christ in real and tangible ways. We will love the lost by reaching out to them in every opportunity with the gospel. And we will do each of these in a purposeful way and with proper stewardship. These four driving factors, these co-values, should be directing the decisions that we make so that we're accomplishing the vision. And what I want to do this week and next is look at two pretty big areas. I can't say that the biggest areas are the only areas, but two pretty big areas that each of us are involved with within the, the mission of Christ as a local body church to explore how we go through these to make the decisions that lead us to the vision. Because again, having the heart of vision is one thing, doing the vision is another. So uh, today, uh, we'll do the tackle of the first one. I want to talk to you about service, about volunteering, about getting your hands dirty, about getting involved. Uh, service is something that is obviously very needed uh, within the, the, the mission that we have, but it's something that we need to talk about through the lens of the core values to find areas that we can grow in as well. Uh, now, again, in the area of service, we've got a lot of things to celebrate here at the fellowship. A lot of things that we're very, very blessed with. I cannot brag more about our kids' ministry team and the leadership we have in the the ministry team. Uh, What they do with what they've got and the hearts that they bring are phenomenal. And to see within the last year that we've been able to double that by not just having a Sunday morning ministry, but Wednesday night ministry to partner with your home ministry is phenomenal. And I hope people are taking advantage of that more and more. There, it's a great team that leads that. Many of them have been doing it for years. To be on the kids' team in some of those positions, they're giving up half of their time of being fed here to feed others. I, I, that, that takes an incredible heart and definitely not a consumeristic heart of what's the church doing for me. Uh, our worship team, I love the commitment we have from our worship team. I love the fact that uh, what was it, last week or two weeks ago, we had the Martin Luther King um, celebration with the community with several other churches, and we were asked uh, if I would speak, and then asked if the team be available. And I like that we're at a point that I can say that Mike, Mike goes, I'm excited, I'm in, and do you think we'll have enough team? We've got enough people, the team will be there. We don't even have to put out the email yet. It's going to happen. God's leading it, it's going to happen. Uh, we had days when it's just one person leading worship or three people leading worship. It's great to have so many people committed, bringing their talents and their skills that we can rotate and we can do different uh, opportunities together. Uh, youth-wise, as your uh, acting youth pastor right now, I'm thrilled that we have four other adults who want to be in the room and love on our kids and be mentors to our kids. We're blessed in that area. We're blessed in the sound booth to have five different people that rotate to make sure that you're covered on video. And audio. We're covered with the offering and greetings in ways that that's one less thing for me to kind of think about on Sunday mornings. The trustee group, the new trustee group, are the bomb. I mean, I, I've tried, if I'm just being honest and real with you, I've tried to bring up trustee teams, those who are, those who take care of the building and the, the property that, that God's trusted us with. We tried to raise it up a couple times and it hasn't happened. Here recently, the guys that have signed on to be trustees, and again, if any lady wants to join in, you're in. I'm not saying that as a sexist, just right now it's all guys. And that kitchen's been knocked out, that parking lot was taken care of outside today. You can't really salt that real well. It'd be melted by 11. But um, they're on it, the, the wall back here where we had the leak, they're on it. These guys have been doing an incredible job. Uh, and I, I pre- appreciate it for, for, for everybody that's in there. Even the mailbox got knocked off by a snowplow, and I'm like, Dude, you guys, seriously, 
I'm not a man. If it wasn't you. But I'm also not the guy to fix that. Carl was like, oh, just go on the way home. That's a huge blessing. And not just in areas where it's groups of people, but if I can bag on one person, and I, I, get, I get leery of doing this because you, you forget, oh, I'll forget somebody and then they'll be mad at me. Uh, so give me grace. Because um, we've got care team and leadership, all kinds of folks. Uh, but uh, I'll bag on Audrey, and she'll hate me for it. But I almost get n- nervous about bringing a need up on this stage because Audrey will say, well, I can help with that. And so, like, when Carrie um, was doing bulletins for two years and she retired, Audrey jumped in. When she saw some needs on Wednesday night with the kids, she's like, hey, can I help with that? When she takes and sees things I don't even ask about, like, hey, how do you feel about a nativity out front? Oh, how do I feel about it? That sounds good, right? <laughs> or, like, coming in and de- I asked them to decorate the floor. Next thing I know, she's here with her, uh, with her son and her, her daughter-in-law and with the grandkids decorating. And we literally just had to have a... Oh, Jenny did. Jenny and Audrey just had a talk because she had heard in our family meeting. And again, not down in anybody, but after our family meeting when we identified some needs and some areas that we need volunteers, I've only had one person come and talk to me. And that's Audrey. And then Audrey was taking and saying, maybe we can start a nursery on Wednesday nights. Maybe I can be part of that so the young kids can come so that the, the adults can be here as well. And we're working on that. We, we, one person can't do that. It takes at least two to be able to do that for safety reasons and also depending on how many kids show up. But we sat, sat down with her, or Jenny did, and said, are you doing too much? Because you can, you can overrun yourself. You can get to a point that you're giving so much that you're not getting refueled to keep going. And she assured us that, that she's fine and we trust that. But I love having those conversations. Those conversations, good conversations, when you say to somebody, are you serving too much? Because most of the time, if we're really honest, the conversation is, come on, guys. Come on. We need you. We need you. So to have conversations of, you are a little bit too excited, or are you doing okay, or can we love on you in some way that we're not loving on you right now, are exciting conversations to have. But we do have needs, and we do have struggles that we'll talk about that we need people stepping up. Because one of the things that we had when we were a church of like 40 and less, everybody was in. Once you get to the point that you've got, I don't know, like you put everybody against like about 120 people, it's real easy to look around and say, well, they can do that, or she can do that, I'm just kind of busy, or whatever the case may be, and we forget that we have to look at the guiding principles to know what we do. So let's look at service from those guiding principles. And we'll start out with the very first one. Um, We'll put that up on the screen for you. We're just going to go one by one. That we will love God by obeying Him and by following Him. Now that's purposely broken out a little bit because, again, it's real easy to say you love God and then just talk about staying home and watching Netflix for the night. Um, We are called to obey Him. So the question becomes, what does the word say about service, and are we obeying that? And there's some scripture I want to go a little bit deeper into with you, but sometimes I find it uh, to be a good thing to kind of do a rapid-fire scripture. So I don't have these scriptures for you. If you like using a version, I don't have these listed in the possible. If you want these scriptures later to look at them deeper, as always, just email me or ask me. I'll, I'm happy to send them to you. But my main goal is to give you a good overview of what the scripture says about service instead of just one section where you can go, well, yeah, but if you take it out of context, Tom's just doing it so you can get more people involved, blah, 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 blah. I want you to know the scripture is clear and repetitive when what God calls us to do when it comes to serving. For instance, Galatians 5.13 says this, You were called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh or for yourself, but through love serve one another. If we go back to the Old Testament in 1 Samuel 12.24, it says, Only fear the Lord and serve Him faithfully with all of your heart and with all your passion. For consider what great things He's done for you. Romans 7, 6 says, Now we are released from the, the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in a new way, through the Spirit, and not in the old way, in the written code. Uh, for those who serve a lot and start feeling burnt out, or you don't feel like you're, you're appreciated, Hebrews 6 is awesome. Uh, it says, God is not unjust, so as to overlook your work, and the love that you have shown for His name, in serving the saints, serving within, within the church as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish or lazy, but be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. John twelve twenty six. If anybody sows me, this is Jesus, if anybody sows me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone sows me, the Father will honor him. 
Joshua 22, uh, 5 says, Only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, to love the Lord your God, and to walk in all of His ways, and to keep His commandments, and to cling to Him, and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul. Romans 12, 11, Don't be slothful, don't be lazy in zeal, but be fervent in the Spirit, serving the Lord. 1 Peter 4.10, as each of us have received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. John 14.15, he makes it very clear. He says just this simply, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, then you'll keep my commandments. Mark 10.45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Just time and time and time again, if I want to love God by following and obeying Him, service definitely comes into play. Now, we don't just do it by ourselves, so even though that's definitely part of our personal vision, our personal uh, mission that we're looking at, but we do it collectively. So let's get our Bibles out and look at that from that aspect a little bit deeper as we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I think, is somewhat uh, a little bit more common scripture for many if you're raised within the church or if you, if you like to read the scripture yourself. But this particular section is talking about spiritual gifts. And Paul is writing to a church that's having a lot of conflict and a lot of butting of heads because they're all jealous of each other's gifts. Not necessarily how they're using it, but there's certain ones that have stature that they want there. And so he talks to them about these spiritual gifts. That's the context of the scripture. I could and will and believe that from an argument standpoint of today's text, this is also anything that he's entrusted to us, whether it be a spiritual gift, a normal physical gift, a talent, an ability. These are the things that he calls uh, us to, to work together on. So I just want to make sure we have the original context and how we're looking at it today. If you feel I'm wrong and it's not verbatim scripture, again, ignore it, but you're stuck with the scripture. So starting out verse 12, Paul writes them this. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Now if you jump down to verse 20, it just continues to reiterate this point. Verse 20 says, as it is, there are many parts, yet there's only one body. If you scroll down a little bit more and go to verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So if I'm loving God by serving uh, and and, and following Him, then I also have to look at it from a collective standpoint is where do I fit in within the local body church? Because I'm a a big believer that we are called to community. When we say, I can be a Christian and not go to church, technically maybe, but you're not following God and you're not taking all the best of what He has for you because we're made to be a body. It is shown example-wise, it is taught that we are a body and we work together in a way to serve. Now we've talked about this some before on how we take the individual and we come into the collective and why each of us are needed. One of the things, and again I, I stole this from a church out in California, um, that, that they have an acronym with it, it's called SHAPE, that each of us are unique because all of us have different spiritual gifts. Again, if you accept Jesus as lead and forgive in your life by acknowledging with your mouth he's the son of God, and believe in your heart he died and rose again, and you say my life is yours, I'm going to follow you, then you have a spiritual gift. You've got that part of God that resides within you, the Holy Spirit, where you have spiritual gifts that you're given for the benefit of the community and the church and for outreach. So all of us have different ones. There might be six or seven of us who have prophecy, but we all have different ones. Then we all have a different heart or a different passion or a thing that we're excited about. Maybe you love working with kids, you like working with computers, you like working with finances. All of us have different hearts. All of us have different abilities. Some of those things we're born with, you know, like some people, they just come out of the room singing a song and you're like, oh, they got to be on America's Got Talent, right? I mean, just some people have the natural. Sometimes it takes work and effort to take and learn a skill. If it's, you know, same thing with the music. Nobody comes out of the room just playing guitar. Some people might have a natural tendency more than others, but it's usually like a skill that you learn. Um, if, you, if you got a personality, just who you are as, as, as a person, it's different than other people. And then uh, your experiences are different than everybody else. And while some of those share, maybe some of us have been through divorces and maybe some of us haven't, but you take all five of those and put them together, you are unique. You are, you, there is no other person like you. 
And what we know is you are designed by the passion that we have that no one ever goes spiritually hungry again to be part of that vision, part of that mission in a unique way. And when we're not loving God by following Him and obeying Him, then that part stops. Then that part becomes a, a, a challenge or a hindrance. I bought this the other day. You guys, if anybody in the front row is like, what's he doing with this little wooden man? <laughs> and he, I don't know what all he does. I just got it. This is like one of those things you buy for art. And you can just kind of position them however you want. <laughs> and they, can, they do stuff and whatnot. But I was just kind of playing with, uh, with the, the thought the other day of if we looked at that as the body, if we looked at it from the metaphor of what Paul has given to us, he almost took a die front which didn't he? And he's got this like little sliver sticking out. That's not good. It just takes a couple of Bible studies. I would get that out of him. <laughs> right? But when we're full and when we're healthy as a local body church, then we can run. Then we can do marathons. Then we can do great work. Then we can do things that I used to be able to do in my 20s that I can't do now that I'm coming up on 50. You know what I mean? Like together, when we're doing well, we see God use us in ways that we celebrate. This is from a couple of weeks ago. If you haven't been here, I apologize. But when we brainstorm the things that God has done here, that we've seen Him move in our own lives and other people's lives, it's because people stood up and they served. Nothing happens without people being involved. Now, if we stop messing with this guy, and let's say we have a couple of people that are like broken toes who just like Sunday morning church, or you know, he's got a, just a broken hand here that he can't really use this, this guy starts getting a little bit more challenged. And there's a little bit less he can do when he's hobbling or when he can only use one arm or one hand. All of a sudden, we, we start seeing that in our lives, if you can imagine that. Again, that, those who are 50 and above, you know what I'm talking about, right? All of a sudden, we have limitations and challenges that start coming to play. Let alone, if we start like losing the a whole arm, if we start losing the context of the neck to the head, which is Jesus Christ, or if we start taking and losing a leg here, we, it, it's not hard to start seeing where churches start having to do amputations. <laughs> It's not hard to see where, where, what used to be alive and vibrant is now crippled or blind. You ever seen a church that becomes blind to the needs of the people that are around them? Or have you ever been in an environment where all of a sudden it's, it's deaf because the ears stop listening and the people who are going through struggles are no longer being cared for or being prayed for or having tangible things come into place? The body has to be healthy and it takes all of us to do it. And I can tell you as your pastor, there's areas that we have identified and areas we have not yet talked about where we're not running as effectively and powerfully and passionately as we could be because of people not stepping into the walls of what God's called them to do. He's designed us for this. We love God by obeying Him, by following His word. It's amazing how one person makes such a big difference. You guys saw Friday, uh, and I, I know I'm spending a lot of time here. I'll go a little bit faster on some of these others. Um, but hey, we're all doing lunch together afterwards. We can be here as long as we want. Um, the, um, but I've, I've been doing some... What's that? Remember the nursery. Okay, somebody get snacks for the kids and then give flowers to the workers. Okay, we're covered. We're covered for the next hour. But Friday, I, I took and sent out just a little bit of an update where um, I've been doing some, some physical stuff. I, I, my joke has been, since I turned 46, I've joined the uh, new prescription drug of the year club with a lot of fun, a lot of excitement there. Um, but for the last six, seven months, I've been dealing with some uh, energy issues where I have pretty much just kind of enough energy and motivation to do the work and family time and everything else I just don't really have the motivation for. I've kind of got to focus where I focus and... Uh, to the point that a lot of times just kind of punching through a, t a, a, a moment of, of feeling tired. Uh, and then some days the body just shuts down and I have to lay down for 15 minutes in my office and, and sleep to be able to keep going. So I saw going to the doctor about this and he, he did the MRI and my pituitary gland, which is like the size of a pea. Does anybody ever mess with this stuff? I know someone knows this and someone. Uh, underneath your eyes, behind your nose, is this little pea-sized gland that they feel might be the culprit. And I met with this specialist. It took like five, minutes to get, five months to get in, in with her. And I, I, I won't uh, give you all the details, but as I talked to her, um, I've never been able to have children from a biological standpoint. Um, I have a two-tone disease, so there's areas of my body that uh, can tan and others that will always just stay my natural skin color. Um, I have the tiredness issue. I have some drive issues. Uh, I have some weight issues. 
uh, things I've been dealing with, 20, 25 views, and other things too that are just too personal to talk to you about. Uh, all of those can very easily tie into this one pituitary gland. I was like, holy cow, you've got to be kidding me. Um, one part of the body has such an important role, even if we think that it's nothing. You are not nothing. You are designed, you are called, you are empowered. So, whatever you think that you have and, and your skills and talents, a lot of times you can find it simply by looking at what you've turned into to your job is needed within the body of Christ. Uh, I remember a story, uh, one of the ones I like in Acts 9, uh, there's this lady by the name of Tabitha. Uh, if you look it up again, Acts 9, and Tabitha, we pick up her story at the end of it, kind of, because she dies. And the whole community goes ballistic. The, the, the whole community is crushed because Tabitha has passed away, to the point that they find out that Peter's about a 20-minute jog away from them, so they jog get Peter, so you got to come. Tabitha's died. He's like, who's Tabitha? Don't worry about it. We just need her. We need you. We need you to come and pray over her. He goes because he's so moved by their heart and their passion and their desperation. He prays over her, brings her back to life, and the, everybody worships. And the whole reason why everybody went ballistic is because Tabitha makes clothes. And she made clothes for the Lord and for those who were poor. He could not afford clothes. She just liked to make clothes and give them to people and encourage people. And whatever it is that God has given to you, he can make a difference through it. Now let's go to the second one. Again, we're, we're obeying him as we love him, but we also love each other in real and tangible ways. When we have a community, and we do have a community, there are needs within the community. There are needs when it comes to our children. There are needs when it comes to our youth. There are needs of those who might be dealing with a, a season of poverty. There's uh, needs all the way through our church, and we love each other by serving one another within that, by bringing that shape into that mix. Um, and so a lot of times it, it, the question becomes, do we become somewhat consumeristic within our church of, okay, I'll go to that event because I like that event, and that sounds interesting to me, or I'll buy that new church t-shirt because it looks cool and I didn't like the other ones, or um, I'll take and go and be part of this out outreach event downtown but, but because I know they have it or, or, or I stay home. When it comes to these things, we have to look at what are the needs within the body of Christ and what is my part as part of that body to do it. We, we, we've never been called to be consumers instead, instead of being stewards when it comes to the body of Christ and bringing that shape to the mix when it comes. And there's a real power of showing up. There's a real power of showing up. Uh, even if you don't feel like there's anything you can add to that mix, anything that you can do within that mix, to have people say, I'm in and I love you and we are one family makes a huge difference in the encouragement of others. There are those who serve within the church, whatever church you go to, they get very passionate about their vision, what God's put on their heart. They put together an event. Maybe it's a worship event or maybe it's a VBS event or something along those lines and three people show up. There was something just downright disheartening to those who are doing the service when those that could be supporting it and serving it just by simply showing up do not do their part. Those are the type of things we can look at. Those are the type of things that we can grow with. How am I serving others within the church is a big part of our conversation as well. Uh, the next one, like I said, I'll go a little bit faster with some of these. We all love the lost. We will love the lost by reaching out to them in every opportunity with the gospel. Once again, this is a matter of showing up. This is a matter of taking doing service outside of the walls of the church because it's not just about us. Maybe by being involved in a love ink or a voice of hope or being involved with Tony Point or being involved with some of the other agencies you work with or maybe we don't work with as of yet and being tangibly within the community, going to the Thanksgiving meal that we do at the IMA for those that are in need, loving our people, sharing with people. We had such a, a great turnout from fellowship was at that event. I was so pumped to see us working with other churches and other cultures and other backgrounds to be able to see a real tangible difference. But the main thing to do when it comes to our service is making sure we're not just serving so we feel good, or we're not just serving so somebody says, oh, it's so awesome that you did that, but that we're serving in such a way that it builds a foundation so that when we talk to those who are in need, those who are lost, about Jesus, they have a reason to believe that we're not crazy or that we're in it for our own gain. Is that you see tangible love from the church and in the church in such a way that it draws people to Jesus so that we see that no one goes spiritually hungry again. 
You still with me? Basically, what just the vision tells us, you can only do what's within your control, but the guiding principles say make sure you're doing what's in your control in a mindful way, in a purposeful way to bring these things together. It's not always about being the pastor. It's not always about being the person in charge. Not always about having a lot of resources or even a lot of self-assurance. Uh, another story that stood out to me when it comes to service had nothing to do with building something or leading something. It was Peter taking and walking. Uh, it's Acts chapter 3. Peter's walking along and a beggar cries out to him wanting some cash. You remember this story? So he wants some money. And the, the natural thing for us is either to throw it all over to or look the other way and tell like we didn't hear him. That's what, what most people are going to do. Peter realizes he has no cash on him whatsoever. But instead of looking away and pretend like he didn't hear him, he leans down and he says, So I've got no silver, I've got no gold. But what I do have, I'll give to you. And I will change your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Those are the type of opportunities that we're looking for. Those are the type of things that God would do with us, even when we feel that we're lacking. Because you're not lacking if you've got Jesus and you're living this vision. We still good? Just kind of glazing over some things. Some of these things are going to come together with this next one as we dig into the last of the guiding principles. Chris, if you would. We would do each of these in a purposeful way and with proper stewardship. And that we're going to leave up there for a little bit. This one we're going to spend a little bit of time on. Because we have to break this one into kind of two different ways. Everything we do is purposeful. Everything that we do is with good stewardship. When I'm talking about purposeful, if you just say, yeah, I've got to be a better person and go out into the world, tomorrow's going to be the same old Monday. So it's going to be the same old Monday. We need to be purposeful about the decisions that we're being directed to make from what God has to us to do the vision and lean into. So I wanted to suggest to you a few ways that you can do this as far as being purposeful and doing the vision and the mission that God calls you to in your life. Um, the first one we've talked about a little bit is finding what is your personal mission and your personal vision. Being purposeful about it. Sit down, get into the Word, get into some prayer. Go have coffee with some close Christian friends who can kind of help you with some wise counsel. But what is my mission and what is my vision as an individual? The mission, if you've accepted Jesus, leave and forgiven your life, I'm going to suggest to you 100% of the time is the Great Commission. Having that purpose, having the passion. If you're not passionate about the Great Commission, spend some time in the, the Word and with the Lord and thinking through the experiences you've seen in the past when someone led you to Jesus or when you led someone to Jesus and get that passion back. Get that passion back. And then look at the individual vision. What is my vision, my life? What has God said? Okay, here's, here's what I've entrusted to you. How do I do that? And have that in mind. I think those things do help. Um, the, but the one that I get excited about, and I would suggest to you, is to adopt a, a discipline that every day, you start the day, just simply uh, incorporating into your prayer, or maybe it's its own prayer, um, Spirit, show me the appointment you got for me today. Just show me what you want me to do today. And, and then give me the boldness to do it, whatever it is. Because we are at such a fast pace in most of our lives, that we miss the Holy Spirit whispers anymore. And when we become mindful in our prayers about it, and the Spirit continues to speak, He will show us opportunities of someone that needs listen to, or talk to, or to have one of your stories shared with them, or to be invited to church, or invited to lunch. Those are the type of things that we miss far too often, and we become very purposeful when our prayers become purposeful. And the Spirit will give us those opportunities and then pray for the boldness to take them. Don't let the intimidation or what if they reject me, those things come into place. Lean into them in a purposeful way. Another thing I would suggest is uh, sitting down. If you're uh, like many of us, if you feel like your schedule is constantly going and you're living by your phone schedule or you're living by your daily planner, uh, sit down with that planner and schedule in time it says, this is just for God to move. This is just, I'm going to, I'm going to go to that event uh, early, or I'm going to stay at the event late, or I'm going to uh, not check out and try to multitask, but listen to people around me because I know Jesus is needed uh, in the waiting room of all the parents of my kids doing gymnastics, looking at opportunities to make sure that God has room to move. I'll give you this suggestion. Uh, is one of the things that I would recommend, and I, I suggest this to uh, our care team. I uh, suggest this and encourage this with our kids team, uh, with our teachers. I suggest this and encourage this with our worship team. And I suggest and encourage this to every single one of us. 
They call ourselves fellowshippers. Start a new vision for Sunday mornings that gives you 2020. <laughs> it's, a new, it's a cute little name to make you think about it a little bit. Can you possibly see some benefit of what God can do as far as building community and serving one another in the community around us if we decide church doesn't start at 10.30, it starts at 10.10. And church doesn't end when Tom says God is good, and we all say all the time, but it takes and ends 20 minutes after that. And knowing that 20 minutes before and that 20 minutes after, I'm going to come and not hang out with the same people that I have opportunities to talk to all week long, but I'm going to look for opportunities to build new relationships, listen to the people that need listened to, take and talk to people that you talk to, laugh with people, cry with people, and take and spend that 40 minutes a week, 20 before and 20 after, to do church instead of just listen to Tom talk and enjoy the music. Can you do that? Those are the type of opportunities we're looking for to get purposeful about what we're called to do. Those are some of the things that we can look at at work, at home, at, at, at school, and at, at church. We need to be purposeful. We see this as well exhibited in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. You're going to see where there were widows who were not being taken care of in the daily distribution of, of food because the apostles were so busy with the ministry and sharing the gospel. Do you remember this story? And, and so people were complaining, and the, 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 the apostles in their wisdom said it's not good for us to stop preaching the gospel to make sure that people are being fed. But it's important that people are being fed. So let's raise up a new team of new servants with these qualifications that can oversee this. And that's where we see Stephen and the other six raised up to do things in a purposeful way to serve. And then the other half of this is with proper stewardship. With proper stewardship. What God has given to you, you have to steward well because, brother, sister, we will give an account. And if you're excited at the mission, you want to see it happen today. So we have to use good stewardship of these things that are entrusted to us as well. Uh, some of the things that might come into play with stewardship, and some of these I know we've talked about before, uh, a lot of times we take our personal shape, what God's given to us and trusted to us, and we turn it into our paycheck. A lot of times we take those things and turn it into our job. And that's not necessarily a bad thing for two reasons. Uh, one, you have to take and pay the bills, and God talks to us in financial things and stewardship with that. And secondly, your workplace should be a mission field. So that's not a bad thing. You should be purposefully mindful as work is worship. Uh, but at the same standpoint, when we get to a point that we say, I, gosh, I do that all week. I don't want to do that at church. Or I don't want to do that at VBS. Or I don't want to do that at this special event or those type of things. We might find an area where we're starting to slip a little bit on our stewardship. Uh, the classic ex- example um, is if you, if you love working with kids, you're gifted working with kids, and you become a teacher, and then you have an opportunity to use those gifts and skills for VBS or a kids event or for Sunday mornings with the events, and you're like, that's what I do all week. That's something we have to look at. Now, it's not just about teachers. It's about people who do carpentry work with trustees. It's about people who crunch numbers all week, and maybe they're called to be part of the financial ministry. Uh, maybe it's, it's people that take and deal with, uh, with, with sound or computers or all kinds of things that we do within the church all week that we come up a barrier when it's time for ministry that we say, I don't want to do that because I need that break. That's something that you might really want to just pray about. It might be an issue. Uh, burning out. We've got to make sure that we use proper stewardship so we don't burn out. Um, we are pretty much like cars when it comes to this. If you take and fill up the gas tank and you go for a drive and you're going to go across the country and you're just going at it and you're hauling at the top possible speed limit because we're good Christians and none of us speed, and so you're going across and you get somewhere in that Arizona desert and you run out of gas, it's going to blow. It's not going to be fun at all, right? It's, that's not a good thing. You've got to stop along the way to keep getting refueled. We're the same way. A lot of people that I love dearly who love to serve will go, 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 crash. And then you, I, I, I just need to quit. I need to step off for a couple of months. I need to do this or that. We've got to continue to make sure that we're refueling ourselves through the Word, through community, through things that pour into us instead of things that just take from us. This is a very important aspect. One of the reasons why we find people burning out is because we have three volunteers in an area that needs seven. When everybody's doing their part, we have less burnout. We can fuel one another and move forward to proper stewardship. Um, another area of proper stewardship is um, doing stewardship and, and doing service within proper structure. Uh, there are, on the opposite end of things, there are people that like to be in charge of things, and that's awesome, and that's great. 
but we have to work together towards the vision, work together for the mission. So there's going to be times that people come up and say, I've got this great new idea, and I want to do this, and I want the building on Tuesday nights, and I want this kind of budget, blah, blah, blah. Great, okay, now let's look at it in the big picture. Well, Tuesday nights, this is going on, can we do Wednesday nights? Maybe that doesn't really focus into the vision as a church, but how can we support that as a separate thing that we're supporting you within the ministry that we're having? There are conversations to be had to make sure that everything works within the proper structure that God has called us to is that we're all heading in the right direction at the same time without conflicting with one another. And that impacts finances, schedule, uh, the things that we have in place, how leadership works. If you volunteer to be on the music team, awesome. You are accountable to Mike Russell. So the ideas that you have and the things that you have are great. Want those ideas, want that, 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 uh, that kind of communication, but Mike's got to be in prayer and Mike's got a team of people around him as well to be able to find God's vision for how that works together. And sometimes it doesn't always include everything, but it makes us better by having everything. Does that make sense? And then even then, when the, with, with Mike and with Jenny and the, different things of that nature, it's still not a vacuum. They're still accountable to me. And I'm not in a vacuum. I'm still accountable to the elders and to God. All these things have a proper place, so we have to make sure our structures are within it. Uh, and sometimes there are people who say, yeah, I'll take... I'll take him on with this ministry. Now, Tom, don't, ignore, don't, don't annoy me by having any input on it or don't let anybody over here have any. I just want to do what I want to do. It can be a stewardship issue as well. But the main thing is, is that we're taking what God's given us and being good stewards with it because, again, freely we received, freely we are to give. Because I want to talk to you about one more testimony that we've seen in the Scripture that I think some of us need to reflect on today. And it's one that we just talked about two weeks ago. Am I allowed to double up on Scripture? I've done it before. I can do it again, right? Because we just talked about the story about how vision, personal vision, took and helped Jesus stay on vision and mission. And the, the story that, that we got into, the testimony we got into, is when Jesus, early in his ministry, was teaching at the synagogue. You remember? Teaching in the synagogue, and people are amazed at his teaching. Because he's, he's teaching with 30. Uh, they're just amazed at his teaching. Then he cast out a demon. This is the short version. He cast out a demon from a man, and people are now amazed at his teaching and that he has authority over demons. Then as he leaves that place, he goes to Peter's house, and they find that Peter's mother-in-law is laying deathly ill with a, just a migraine of all migraines in her bed. And Jesus goes in and heals her. And then everybody finds out about that healing, and now they were amazed at his healing and about his authority over demons, but they were no longer amazed about his teaching. And so his vision helped him leave that situation to teach because he was called here to teach. Now, that's a very short version of something we really dug into. But I think it's enough for us to look at it from a little bit of a different vantage point and put ourselves not in the place of how Jesus navigated all that and the disciples navigated all that, but from the, the vantage point of Peter's mother-in-law. Because what that story tells us is that she had a heart to serve people. When she was healed, she got up and started serving people in the house. That, it, it, it takes and shows us. She, I mean, that's what she wanted to do. There was just one big problem. This huge migraine that had her laid up in bed. That there's times that we are created to be and maybe even have a passion to be servants and do passionate things and awesome things and big things for the kingdom, but have challenges that stop us. In her case, there's a migraine. And I can tell you, Right off the top of my head, two or three people that I know that really struggle with migraines. And it seems like they always come up when God's wanting them to do something cool. I don't know, if you, if you have migraines, you might know what I'm talking about. I've seen migraines used in spiritual warfare before. Um, it might not be migraines, it might be depression. It could be anxiety. It could be past hurt. It could be intimidation. It could be I tried it before and it didn't work before. It could be... Um, a little bit of self-struggle because I used to do that all the time and no one appreciated it. And we forgot that what we're going for is God and His laughter and His excitement and His passion about what you're doing more so than what anybody else thinks. And so if we're going to look at these guiding principles to get the decisions to take and get to the mission, we also have to look at the struggles and the walls that we have to get around and say, Jesus, I need you. There was nothing else that could have helped Peter's mother-in-law that night except for Jesus. That, the challenge was too much. The pain was too overwhelming. And some of us have that in our hearts. Some of us have pride issues that keep us from serving. 
Some of us serve in certain areas because we're comfortable with those people, but I don't want to serve here because I'm not comfortable with those people. There's all kinds of things that can stop us. Image issues, struggle issues, emotional issues, relational challenges. How somebody that you're supposed to go talk to smells. These are the migraines that stop us, that we need Jesus, because all of that is just junk that Satan throws into the path to keep the mission the thing we're passionate about, the thing we dream about. No one being spiritually hungry ever again. It's Satan. And some of us might not have written down something simply because of that. Some of us might have wrote down something safe instead of something that's a little bit more daring for us that need to scratch out the safe thing and put the daring thing. And some of us just need Jesus. Jesus.